Good morning, church. How are we doing? I think we could do better. How are we doing? Yeah, there we go. I know times are rough, but we have to be excited because the Lord is faithful. Amen. Amen. Right, church. So my name is Diego. I serve here as an usher and as a greeter. So at this time, I'm privileged to say that I will be read to you our scripture for the day, um, which is found in Habakkuk chapter 3. So it says, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shekinah, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations, then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your, was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers, or your indignation against the sea, when you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and were. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in the place, and the light of your arrows as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You thrashed the nations in anger. You went out for, for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to the neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters in my, into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. Thank you. Well, December 10th, 2013 was a special day. It was the day that I took Elise Catchings on our first date. And when we sat down at Monomica B, a French pastry place in Resson Town Center, Northern Virginia, um, I knew that, that this was going to be my wife. And so I just thought, you know, I'm going to just lay it all out there. And I don't necessarily recommend this approach, but I'm going to lay it all out there. And if it's meant to be, she's, it's going to resonate. And if not, we'll both, you know, kind of, it'll be a little bit of an awkward rest of the date. But we'll go our separate ways and know that this was not meant to be. So I just said, kind of at the end of the date, I said, um, Elise, I, I want you to know that I, I hope that one day I'll have a big family. I said, I um, want to do ministry in my life and, and maybe do ministry overseas. And I want to pursue a friendship with you that I hope will lead to marriage. And she looked at me and she said, okay. <laughs> and we were off and running. Three, meets, three months later, we got engaged. And as great as that, that dating period was, I mean, it was exciting. It was like we would go at, you know, Monday night was like our date night. And it was like, 
I could not wait till Monday, right? She was, I was off on Monday, and so after, after she finished work, we would go and go on our various dates. And, and that three-month dating period was so great. Little did I know that the engagement period is like purgatory. Now, I know we're a Protestant church. We don't necessarily believe in purgatory, okay? But engagement, don't believe the hype. It's the worst season ever. You know why? Because you were so close to being married and so far at the same time. I mean, those six months felt like forever. We went about, we were trying to honor God with our relationship. We had, you know, various physical boundaries in place because we wanted, when we said I do, we wanted that to, to mean something. And so I just remember wanting to be married for reasons that you could probably understand. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's hard to wait. There's promises that God has for you. There's things you're looking forward to, things that you're hoping in, and yet you're in a present circumstance that seems so far away from what you believe God has called you to. What do you do while you're waiting? We, don't, we generally don't like to wait very much, and we're not very good at it. We don't know what to do when we're in, I mean, even if you're waiting in line, right, at the grocery store, it's like an agonizing feeling. In fact, the average iPhone user touches their phone 2,617 times a day because we hate that, that feeling of our minds being uh, unoccupied. Our attention span is decelerating at a rapid rate. In fact, the average attention span is eight seconds for a human being. That's less than a goldfish. I'm serious. We have less of an attention span. I don't know what that says about the human species. Things are not looking good for us. So to avoid, well, 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 let me put it this way. When we're in that season of waiting, because maybe that the fulfillment to that promise or the things that we're hoping for seems so far away, generally what can happen is maybe one of two things. One, we're tired of waiting, so we take matters into our own hands. We end up compromising in some way. Or two, we, we're actually obedient to what God is saying, but we wanted him to know that we're not very happy about it. And so we complain and we grumble, and it's just like, I want to live a Christian life that's more than just doing the right thing, but being miserable while I'm doing it. Amen? So Habakkuk teaches us really a third way while we wait. The title of this sermon is While You Wait. If you're just joining us today, uh, this is, if this is your first Sunday, we've been in a series on the book of Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk is this small, minor prophet in the Old Testament, kind of a hard book to, to find in your Bibles, but Habakkuk was very significant in uh, just the relationship that he had with God. Most of Israel's prophets got a message from God and would speak on behalf of God to a particular nation. Habakkuk, what we find in Habakkuk's story is more this back and forth, intimate conversation between Habakkuk and God. And Habakkuk is really wrestling with some of the deeper questions that we as human beings wrestle with. He's asking God, where are you in the midst of injustice? Habakkuk lived in a time where the leaders of his nation of Judah had all but abandoned God's word and injustice and oppression of the poor was rampant. And so Habakkuk is saying, God, are you going to do anything about this? Are you going to intervene in any way? It felt like God was far. And so God speaks to Habakkuk, and he says, Habakkuk, I'm actually, I am going to do something about this. I'm raising up a empire, the Chaldeans, later who would be known as the Babylonians. They're going to come, and they're going to invade your home nation of Judah, and they're going to punish Judah for their sin. And Habakkuk's thinking, wait, 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 that's not what I had in mind at all, because the Chaldeans were even worse off morally than his own people. And so God, Habakkuk couldn't understand, God, how, would you, how could you use such an evil instrument to execute your judgment? And so God speaks to him, and he says, Habakkuk, if the vision seems slow, wait for it. It'll come to pass in its proper time. And the story of Habakkuk is really about Habakkuk wrestling with God in the midst of his uncertainty and growing in faith in the character of who God is. So God tells Habakkuk that he is going to punish the Babylonians eventually as well. 
that he's going to use the Babylonians temporarily to bring about justice on his people, but eventually the Babylonians are going to experience justice for the sins that they've committed, for their cruelty, for their oppression. And so it leads to Habakkuk chapter 3, where Habakkuk is clear that he's entering into, and his nation is entering into one of the darkest periods of their lives, where they'll go into Babylonian captivity. And God is going to deal with the Babylonians, but it's going to be a a while. It's It's going to be a long way off. And so Habakkuk has to kind of live in that tension of destruction before him while holding on to the hope that is to be his in the future. And I think that's many of us here today. That there's something that we're believing God for, maybe something in a relationship, maybe something in a job or a financial situation, hopes that we have. Maybe God has even spoken to us. He's given us promises about something in the future. But what we see around us seems like devastation, seems like darkness. And what do you do while you wait, while you live in that tension? Habakkuk gives us a third way. Habakkuk chapter 3 is an extended prayer that Habakkuk is praying to God. Because I've found that, and maybe you'd agree with this, that waiting can be a miserable experience unless you enjoy the people you're waiting with. You ever go to a restaurant and you're with your friends? Suddenly you don't care that the food's not coming out in 30 or 45 minutes, right? Because you're with the people that you love. And so prayer is an invitation to wait with God, to bring God into your waiting, to bring the one who's all-knowing and all-powerful in your company while you wait. Now, most of us, I'd imagine, can we be honest for one second in church? Most of us, I don't think we really enjoy praying, many of us. Even, it feels bad even just saying that out loud. But the reality is, I think most of us would say, well, I don't pray as much as I should, right? Why is that? Maybe it's because we feel like we're busy. Maybe we feel like nothing happens when we pray. Or maybe we feel like we don't actually know how to pray. And so there's something in Habakkuk chapter 3 in this prayer. There's two specific ways that I think can transform our prayer lives. Looking back at how this prophet, in the midst of the uncertainty, in the midst of him holding on to these two points of tension, there's something about what Habakkuk saw about who God is that can help us while we wait, can help us in our prayer lives. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write down this first one. Habakkuk sees God as Lord over creation. You see throughout Habakkuk chapter 3 this creation imagery. He's pulling together these various features of nature. He's talking about how God, in verse 6, measured the earth. He scattered the mountains. He sank the hills. Later in verse 9, he talks about God splitting the earth with rivers. Raging waters, verse 10, swept on. Then he talks about the sun and the moon in verse 11 when they stood still. God trampled the sea in verse 15. So Habakkuk is giving us almost like an exploration of the topography of, of Israel and the surrounding areas. What he's doing is he's actually recounting Israel's history. He's, he's going like Nat Geo. He's, he's giving us a, uh, uh, he's being a guide for Israel's journey from Egypt into the wilderness ultimately into the promised land. And he's recounting how God moved supernaturally in nature in order to lead Israel. Now, many of you know the story of Israel. They were in captivity in Egypt. They were slaves. And God performed these 10 plagues against the Egyptians. And the, one, of the, one of those plagues, the one that, or, or one of them that really Uh, opened the Egyptians' eyes to the power of God was when God turned the Nile River, which was the Egyptian source of, uh, of sustenance and their whole economy was wrapped into the Nile River. He turned the Nile River into blood, desecrating their economy in a moment. God has power over all the gods, the Egyptian gods, one of which they thought was 
controlled the Nile River. And then he talks about, Habakkuk talks about the, the Red Sea, God splitting the sea. Because when God led the Israelites out of Egypt, they're faced with the Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptians behind them. And the Egyptians, I mean, you think about it. What would, what would make the Egyptians say, okay, well now, after we've had these 10 plagues and all of our gods have been destroyed, now I think we can destroy the Israelites. Well, the, the Egyptians thought what most nations thought during that time, which, that, which was that a god had control over a particular land or area, but outside of that locale, a god would be powerless. So when the Israelites left out of Egypt, the Egyptians go, oh, wow, okay. Well, apparently their God was pretty powerful in our nation. But now that the Israelites have left our nation, we're good. So they're chasing the Israelites. And God, you know the story, splits the sea. And the Israelites walk on water or walk on land, dry land. The Israelites are are in the wilderness. And they've been called by God to go into the promised land. And what separates them between the wilderness that they're in and the promised land is this Jordan River that would flood the plains during flood season that was a mile wide that you couldn't cross. And God dries up the Jordan River so that they can cross. Israel goes into one of their first battles at Gibeah. They're fighting against the the Canaanites and God makes the sun and and the moon stand still so the Israelites can defeat the Canaanites. Habakkuk is recounting that God is not only the creator of the universe, he's the creator of the sun, moon, the stars, he's creator of the seas and the rivers, but he's Lord over those things, that he can make those things suspend in a moment. God's powerful. Now, God is actually doing those kind of things today, believe it or not. In fact, there's this book, uh, Miracles Today, by a guy named Craig Keener. He's a New Testament uh, scholar, theologian. And he wrote this book. This is actually the condensed version. His his larger work is a thousand-page book, a tome, really, of all of these recorded miracles worldwide, documented miracles with witnesses and just thousands of pages of testimony after testimony of people getting up out of wheelchairs, people being raised from the dead. God intervening in using weather and and just in miraculous ways. But there's one story in particular that I want to read to you. He has a chapter, and literally the book is either the most riveting thing or the most boring thing, because it's just miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle with very little commentary. But he talks about a colleague, and he says that this man and his family just moved to a new community. He was getting a roof on his new dwelling, and completing the roof would take about four more days. Some residents of the village mocked his mission and presence in the village, noting that it was the rainy season and everything he had would be ruined before he could get on a roof. Unfortunately, the man lost his temper, declaring, it's not going to rain one drop of rain in this village until I have a roof on this dwelling. His critics laughed as they walked off. And this man, realizing what he had done, fell on his face before God. What have I done? He cried in dismay. For the next four days, however, the village remained dry while rain fell all around it. After this event, only one person in the village remained non-Christian, and residents to this day recount that incident as what precipitated the village's conversion. God is still moving in miraculous ways around the world. When I was a college student at uh, Virginia Tech, we, one of the guys really had a vision for proclaiming the name of God during the night, Friday night, when college campus is running rampant, right? And so he gathered the Christians together in this little chapel, and we prayed throughout the night from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. We were college students. We were crazy, right? Stay up all night and pray. And God, I mean, the first 30 minutes, it was like, this is going to be a really long night. I mean, like, what did we just sign up for? I mean, it was, it was what you might think an all-night prayer meeting would be, if you picture that. Like, what, how, how do you pray for six hours, seven hours? That sounds incredibly boring. But within 30 minutes, this guy came up. He gave this, like, fiery speech about how God had called us to stand on our congregation, that the light of Jesus Christ was, Christ was going to break through, and that our prayers was bringing this light into this area of darkness. The presence of God came into that room. 
And I promise you, I'm worshiping. I look at my watch, and it was 5 a.m. I mean, the time just, it was like we were in the presence of the Lord. And we stepped, we stepped out of, out of uh, the, this chapel. And I'll be honest, in my flesh, I had, I had this thought. God, this was great, but I hope we never have to do this again. <laughs> and you're wondering, is this really making a difference, God? Is this really what you call us to do? Because he wanted to do it once a month. And as we're walking out of the chapel, if you've ever been to Virginia Tech, there's this big drill field that separates the academic side from the, uh, from the dorms. And as we walk out of this chapel, there's a double rainbow over the, the drill field. And it was like God, his affirmation that, yes, there's a group of people who are standing for me on campus. I'm with them. God still uses weather. He's still, he's still moving in this world to prove to us that he is God. And so Habakkuk is in awe of God. He's recounting Israel's history in awe, in fear of who God is, in reverence of who God is. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes my prayers feel so tame, as if if we've lost our sense of wonder. If you could put that quote on, on the screen. This is Douglas Copeland, a Canadian novelist and designer. He says, sometimes I think the people to feel saddest for are people who once knew what profoundness was, but who lost or became numb to the sensation of wonder. People who close the doors that lead us into the secret world or who had the doors closed for them by time and neglect and decisions made in times of weakness. What he's describing is that we go about this life and because we're so into our our phones and the 24-7 news cycle and the grind of work, we lose our sense of wonder of the fact that God is a creator, that God is Lord over creation and that God intervenes in our lives. And so for some of us, maybe what would revolutionize our prayer lives is just getting outside, is going on a hike, is going to Kenilworth Gardens, or maybe going to Theodore Roosevelt Island, or or taking a day on a Saturday to the Shenandoahs or to Harper's Ferry, and get out and see the majesty of God's creation so that we can fall in love, re-fall in love with the bigness of our God, the majesty of our God that he splits the seas, that he created the heavens and the earth, the mountains, the rivers. All of creation is telling a story of God's meta-narrative, his grand storyline of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. You look at the trees, the leaves changing right now. They're, They're speaking of the fall. And in the spring, the new leaves will come, speaking of the resurrection of Christ. All of creation is telling a story of our great God. I never forget on our wedding day, we're, we're flying to our, uh, our honeymoon in, in Lake Tahoe, which is kind of on the border of Nevada and, uh, and California, and just reflecting on the fact that 200 people, close friends and family, had all come to celebrate us. Like, that's the beautiful thing about a wedding, right? It's like you have the people in your, li- your lives that are closest to you stop everything and come to celebrate you. But then as we're, as we're in Lake Tahoe, we're seeing this beautiful lake and, and these mountains and just the majesty. It was like a reminder, like, oh, this isn't about us. Like, this world exists without us having anything to do with it. There's something about being in nature. There's something about being a part of seeing God's glory that, that recenters us on the majesty of God. Habakkuk draws out that God is Lord over creation. And then secondly, this theme emerges in Habakkuk 3 that God is a mighty warrior. He's a mighty warrior. Look at verse 6. God is shaking the nations. Verse 8, he's riding on horses and chariots. Verse 9, he's armed with bow and arrows. Verse 11, he's flashing his spear. Now, for my family... These are, our, uh, these are our memorial stones. And we decided early on that we didn't want to forget what God had done in our lives. The, mir- the miracles, the deliverance, the supernatural works that he's done. 
And so in Joshua, the people of God, when they were, before they, they crossed, or after they crossed the Jordan River, they set up memorial stones to remember what God had done, to teach the next generation. And so on these rocks, we would write down things that God's done. And so here I have spring 2014. My wife had a, a foot that was messed up. She was about to run a marathon. God healed her foot so that she could run this half marathon. I have this, this stone that talks about our daughter walking. Our daughter was born with severe hydrocephaly. For a year, she was on her back. She was in the NICU for two and a half months. Doctors told us she'd never survive. She'd never make it. And in fact, one of the first doctor uh, that we saw said, if you care about her quality of life, you should just have an abortion because she'll never be born alive. And God did a miracle. Now she's seven years old. And I remember when she was, what, two and a half or three years old and she took her first steps, we wrote down on this rock to remember Willow walking. I remember um, graduating, or graduating college having no money but wanting to get married <laughs> and needing a place to, to get married. And uh, you know, the church perks of being a pastor, I got to use the church for free. That was cool. But we were looking for a reception area, and uh, we were walking in Elise's, in, his, in her house, in her neighborhood, and there was a woman who lived uh, next door named Trudy who had bought not only her house, but the house behind her was her son's house. And so she made a combined backyard with a gazebo, with fountains, with chickens. That was pretty cool. And we're kind of talking to her and, and just explaining, you know, we're, we're praying about where we could have our, our wedding. And she said, oh, you should have it right here. And in this beautiful backyard wedding. Now, I know you're thinking backyard. That's not, it was like backyard does not do it justice. It was amazing. And so God provided for us in order that we could get married. We didn't have to drop $50,000 uh, and get into debt, which a lot of couples do. My point is that there are memorial stones in our lives. And when we recount what God has done in our life, like Habakkuk recounted, God may not have, I mean, we might not have physically been in battles, but we have faced battles, amen? And God has brought us through, and there are victories. And maybe in your prayer time this week, maybe as you gather with other people, whether you join on Sunday night on our prayer call or whether you're in a small group, maybe take a moment to recount what God has done. Because when you're in that fog, when there feels like there's no clarity, reminding yourself of what God has done, reminding yourself of how faithful he's been, allows you to wait in hope. God is Lord over creation. God is a mighty warrior. And all of this leads to awe. Habakkuk says in verse 16, he says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bone. My legs tremble beneath me. Here's a man who's been undone by the majesty of God. And he says, yet I will wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Psychologists did a study of a group of people who had experienced what they call an awe event, something in their, their lives that had uh, that they would categorize as an awe event. And as they, and, they, and this, the psychologist asked them to draw a picture of themselves after this event. And statistically, the people drew themselves smaller after the awe event. Because when you've had an encounter with the majesty of God, when you've gotten outside in nature and you've seen how big God is, when you recount the ways he's delivered you, he's, he's healed you, he's saved you, you can't help but get smaller and God get bigger. That's what prayer is all about. It's not as much the circumstances changing as it is God changing us. It's not, about, it's not as much about, God, can I twist your arm so I get the desired outcome, but God actually changing something so he gets an outcome in us. 
is that while we wait, God is doing something. And you see that transformation in the book of Habakkuk. You see Habakkuk wrestling with the uncertainty, wrestling with the confusion, and finally getting to this place where nothing's changed in the natural, but Habakkuk's changed. God's gotten bigger. And his prayer turns into praise. Now, this is something I didn't see until this week. How many musicians do we have here? Any musicians in the house? Singers? The prayer of chapter 1 and 2 of Habakkuk turns into the praise of chapter 3. Verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no fruit. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Diego read chapter 3, the beginning, this, this shigianoth. Now, what does that word mean? You see that? Can you put that up there, Habakkuk 3, verse 1? A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to the shigianoth. That's a musical term found in the Psalms. Did you see in verse 3, in verse 9, in verse 13, there's this word salah, which we don't know the exact meaning, but we think it's a musical break. Then at the very end, put the last verse up there for a second, to the choir master with stringed instruments. See, there's something that happens when you pray and you wrestle with God that your prayer turns into praise. How do you know you've successfully waited on God when you can look at your circumstances and as bleak as they might look, you still can praise God? When you can jump for joy in the wreckage, when you can delight even when things haven't changed in the natural, you have successfully waited on God. When you can sing in the shadows and you can dance in the destruction, God is near. Pastor Stephen I don't, I mean, I appreciate all these stories of the sun standing still and God splitting the seas, but I, I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. But is there a clearer picture of God vanquishing your foes than when Jesus slayed death and sin once and for all on the cross? Is there a more poignant example of God's power over nature than when his son overcame the natural end? that we'll all face in death, and he rose from the dead. God has given us the clearest example of his lordship over creation, over his lordship as a mighty warrior in the cross. And, you know, over these last six or seven weeks, as, as we've been going through this series, as we've been wrestling with injustice and where is God and asking God to intervene and asking God to change us, I just thought it would be fitting to end with praise. Can I invite the worship team to the front? We're going to end with praising our God. And you know, there's power when you praise God, even when you don't understand what he might be doing. There's power when you may not even know the outcome, but you say, God, just like Habakkuk said, even if this means that I don't know what's going to happen, even if you, the fig goes and, the, and, and, and everything is lost, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to rejoice in you. That's the power of praise, is it changes us. Could you stand to your feet as we praise Jesus one more time this morning?